uh, for for your header, but 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 again, you know, uh, it wouldn't hurt you at all to take both uh, if, if you have room for it. Okay, so. Um, uh, so what I uh, wanted to do today is uh, um, do like our, our, our first real uh, uh, examples of uh, models of computation, just you know, to get our feet wet. Uh, but uh, but also uh, um, see some some really interesting models. So I mean, I think the the uh, you know maybe the, the the most basic model of computation that there is. Uh, or you know the like the uh, uh, the simplest one to, to talk about is uh, is that of circuits. Okay. Um. All right. Maybe I'll, I'll I'll leave this up for a little for people who are just coming in. Uh, so. Okay. So so just a uh, uh, Boolean logic circuit. So. Uh, uh, so what's a circuit? Well, so if you've taken a, 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 a double E classes, you know, you've seen circuits that have things that look like this or something or something like this or uh, I don't know exactly, okay? But uh, in any case, you know, they have uh, all these different uh, components in them, you know, and, and there's always a closed loop, right? Because, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the electrons have to flow all the way around in a circle. Okay, uh, uh, in, in theoretical computer science, uh, uh, ironically, uh, circuits are never closed loops. Okay, that's like the one rule about them, that uh, they have to be acyclic, uh, not contain any cycles. Okay, so um, what we mean by a circuit, basically, is a, a, um, a, a sort of a, a network of logical operations, so where you start out with some bits that are given to you as input. Uh, like let's say X, Y, and Z. And then uh, you can do operations on them. So uh, we have the not gate, for example. That just, you know, if X is zero, then it outputs one. And if X is one, then it outputs zero. Uh, you know, and there are symbols for all these things, but I'll, I'll just write the names of them because that, 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 that's easier. Uh, we also have the AND gate, which uh, outputs one if and only if, you know, both of the inputs are one. Okay. And we have the OR gate, which outputs one if either or both of the, of the inputs are one and otherwise outputs zero. Uh, we have the XOR gate, which uh, outputs one if the uh, two input bits are different, and uh, outputs zero if they're the same. Okay, or in other words, just outputs their sum uh, modulo two. Okay, and. Um, And then what you're allowed to do is build up uh, a more, more complicated logical operations by just stringing a bunch of these together okay. and you know, feeding the, uh, the output of one into the input of another. So, so to take an example, uh, let's say that we wanted to compute the majority function of three bits, x, y, and z, meaning we just want to know, you know are, are the majority of these bits equal to one? Okay, how could we do that using, um, uh, well, uh, using the gates that I that I that I uh, listed there, using let's say and or not gates. So I just want to know if at least two of the bits are one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we could do it with XOR. You know, in, in, in fact, there's a way to do it using only AND and OR gates. We don't even need, yeah, need anything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Let's try that. Uh, does this work? Um, Unfortunately, I don't think so. So, for example, suppose y is 1 and x and z are, are 0. 
right? Then you're going to get 1, 1, 1, even though, uh, uh, yeah. So, okay, but this, this sort of almost works. Can anyone, yeah, fix it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. So, so let's say we just and x and y and y and z uh, and x and z. Okay, and then we just or all of these. So, so we could do that. You know, if I just say I just or all of them. Now, now I didn't explicitly tell you that you're allowed to have an or. Uh, the, uh, of three things, right? Uh, the, the number of inputs to a gate, by the way, we call the fan-in of the gate. Okay, so I didn't, uh, I didn't tell you that we have an or of fan-in three, but that doesn't actually matter. Uh, why not? Because, well, because you can build one anyway, okay? All you have to do uh, is uh, or two of these ands, like that, and then or uh, the result of that with the remaining and. Right, because the uh, the or function is associative. Right, you can just or by you know you can keep taking ors, and you know, and, the, and this is equivalent to just the or of all the things. Okay, so um, so that'll that th this will represent the majority function because it just directly encodes it. Right, it says you know it's just sort of looking for any pair of the uh, uh, bits that are that are both one, and as soon as you know it finds one of those, then the uh, you know, then the, 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 uh, then the circuit is happy, right? So, um, okay. So, uh, so, you know, we can build, of course, much more complicated things. Uh, you know, we could build uh, a circuit that performed binary addition onto uh, 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 numbers written in binary or that multiplied them or, uh, uh, or that, or that ran Windows or, 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 or Linux, okay? Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to do any of those things on the, on the p-sets, okay? But uh, if you uh, take, um, you know, in, 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 in your systems courses and in, in computer architecture courses, you will basically learn or, or have learned maybe how to design adders and multipliers and things like that just, just, uh, just by stringing a bunch of logic gates together, okay? Of course, you know, this, 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 this is, uh, 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 this is what's going on, you know, in, in your computer at the at the lowest level, right? Uh, in some sense, you know, the um, what a what a transistor is is, you know, it's precisely like a a, a solid state, you know, physical device that allows you to implement things like AND and OR and NOT gates, you know, in a very reliable way, right? Uh, because you know you can use uh, you know a very very weak current to control a much more powerful current, and you know and that you know once you have that ability, you can sort of use it to to construct logic gates. Okay, so um, um, okay, but now uh, you might still be be worried about something, which is you know I just. I just listed a few specific gates, right? You know, the AND gate, the OR gate, the NOT gate. I mean, who's to say that this is a complete list, right? I mean, you know, even if you were able to use your uh, transistors to build those gates, right? Why, uh, 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 you know, as soon as I want to do something else, why, why, uh, well, why shouldn't I need some uh, uh, some other logic gate? Uh, so, uh, so this leads us to sort of an important concept that will. Uh, you know, show up again and again in this course. Uh, which is the concept of, of universality, okay? Uh, so, um, So in this context, you know, let's say uh, if, we, if I give you a set of logic gates, like and, or, and not, you know, we'll call the set universal. If by just stringing together gates in that set,
we can represent any Boolean function on any number of bits. Okay, so uh, uh, this is just a little bit of notation, right? I, I mean, uh, the, the, this means that f is a Boolean function that takes n bits as input. So its input is an element of the set 0, 1 to the n, meaning its input is a string of n bits. Okay, and its output is a bit, a 0 or 1. Okay, uh, now it's clear that if we can, you know, create any Boolean function with, one, with a one-bit output, then we can also create any Boolean function with however many output bits we want, because we just, you know, uh, uh, you know, have one circuit to output the first bit, have another circuit to output the second bit, and so forth. Right, so that's, so, so, so that's the reason why we can, we can just concentrate for simplicity on, uh, uh, on circuits that produce one bit uh, as their output. Um, and so, uh, you know, so, so it's not, you know, entirely obvious uh, uh, a priori that there's, you know, any uh, finite set of gates that, uh, that's going to be universal, right? Um, okay, um, you know, one thing that I, uh, that I, that I always uh, uh, dislike in, in math classes is when they give you a definition and they never tell you any examples of anything that doesn't, that don't satisfy the definition, right? Like, uh, uh, you know, in elementary school, I had to memorize what, you know, what's commutative, what's associative, right? But it's completely pointless if you've never seen anything that's not commutative or that's not associative, okay? So, So let me, uh, so, so let's see some examples of things that are not universal, okay? Just, just in order to see that, you know, that, that universality is not a trivial concept. All right, what, what, well, what's an example of a set of gates that's not universal, anyone? In the sense that cannot be used to represent every function, yeah. Uh, yeah, if we only had the identity gate, yes, absolutely, good example, okay? Uh, we could only compute the identity function. All right, what's another example? Yeah. Yeah, if we only have the not gate, well, you know, you're never going to be able to compute anything that involves more than one bit, right? Every bit will be its, you know, will be its own island, okay? No, no, you know, no two will ever talk to each other. All right, what's another example? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, um, uh, and and or uh, f fails to be a universal set. What can and and or not represent? Not, yes. Uh, yes, and, and, um, and, and what's the reason for that? Uh, why can't they represent not? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. I mean, you you can okay. You're 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 yeah. You're you're absolutely sort of grasping toward the yeah. The, the, so the, uh, there's a word for what you're you're trying to get at. The the uh, the word we use is monotone. Okay. So and and or are are both monotone functions. Uh, monotone means that if you change one of the inputs from zero to one then that can only ever change the output from zero to one, right? You know, or it could also leave the output unaffected, right? But changing an input from zero to one will never change the output from one to zero. Okay, that's what monotone means, yeah. Ah, okay, so, 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 so this actually raises a good point which is when we talk about universality, uh, this, so this is, you know, uh, th th this is just a convention, you know, this is, this is a choice that we can make. Okay, but um, uh, we're, uh, we're, in this class, we're going to say that constants are available for free. So, which means, you know, you can always, even if you have a two-bit gate, you can always get a one-bit function by just feeding, you know, uh, like a zero or a one, you know, into one of its input wires. Okay, you can always just fix one of the input wires to be zero or one, 
right? And then you know re restrict the function like that. Okay, so you could always, uh, for example, if you had an AND gate, uh, uh, this will you know you could represent just just x itself like that. Okay, by just saying the AND of x with one. Okay, so uh, so that's just the technicality, but uh, but good point. All right, so so um, so and and or are clearly both monotone functions, right? Changing um, Right, they both satisfy this, and the the property of being monotone, you know, is closed under composition. So, you know, if I take two gates that are monotone and you know I string them together, I still get a monotone function. Okay, and uh, 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 whereas the not function is clearly not monotone. <laughs> okay, so uh, so that that's why this set fails to be universal. Does anyone know uh, another set, a uh, different set of Boolean uh, gates that's not universal? There's, there's basically one other interesting uh, possibility. Uh, it's, it's one that's already been on the board, actually. Yeah. Yeah, XOR. In fact, I can even take uh, XOR and I can throw in the NOT gate also. Okay, XOR and NOT. Uh, this will also uh, fail to be a universal set. What, 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 what am I not able to represent using XOR and NOT gates? Anyone? Hmm? A yeah, AND, for example. Okay, uh, why, uh, uh, why can't I represent the AND function using XOR and NOT gates? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, that that's true, but you know, but but I'm allowed to string together a whole bunch of XOR gates, right? So I still need to say, why can I never get an AND gate, no matter how many XORs I put together? Uh, yeah. Oh. Uh, so I'm not I'm not sure I understand that, but. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. So 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 ultimately, you know, I want some sort of invariant, you know, I want some property that's going to be preserved no matter how many XOR and NOT gates I string together. Uh but you know, but which is not satisfied by the AND function. Okay? And yeah. 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 The property that I want here is uh, is actually is linearity. Okay? Uh or, you know, with and and or preserve that the, the, the function is always monotone, XOR and not preserve that the function is always linear. What do I mean by linear here? Uh, I actually mean uh, linear modulo 2. Okay, so linear over the field that has two elements. Okay, so uh, uh, so I can think of The XOR of X and Y, if I, you know, interpreted it algebraically uh, as a as an arithmetic operation on bits, then it's just X plus Y mod two, right? That's all it is. Okay. Uh, if I interpret not as an arithmetic operation, what's not? Anyone? One minus X, right? 1 minus x mod 2. In fact, it's also 1 plus x mod 2. Okay. Uh, you know, if you're mod 2, plus and minus are the same thing. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, now these are both linear functions, right? So you can compose these, you know, like you could have the xor of x and y and the xor of that with, with z, for example. 
but that's just going to give you x plus y plus z, my, you know, mod, mod 2, right? You're always going to have a linear function in your input bits. No matter how many linear functions you compose, you're never going to get a quadratic function, for example. Okay, but what is and as an, uh, as an algebraic function, mod 2? Yeah. Yeah, ab exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay. By the way, you know, this, this correspondence between, you know, uh, Boolean operations and, and algebra, this is, this is why we call them Boolean operations in the first place, because George Bull in the 1800s, you know, noticed this. Correspondence. I mean, I mean, I, I, I guess someone had to, uh, had to be the first to do it, right? So, uh, um, discoveries back then were sort of easier to make. Okay. So, um, all right. But so, and is a degree two function. You know, you're never going to get it by you know composing all the, the these linear operations. Okay. Uh, so, uh, um, in 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 an in interesting fact, which. Uh, um, maybe I'll put on, on P set one is that these are sort of the only, you know, um, um, monotonicity and linearity are in some sense the only two ways for a, a, a collection of Boolean gates uh, with constants available for free to fall short of being universal. Okay, so, so in other words, what we're saying is that, is that uh, 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 and, and this is again, again a very sort of general phenomenon in computer science, uh, universality is sort of the rule rather than the exception, right? You have to, you actually have to work somewhat hard to, to avoid being universal, okay? Um, and uh, so without further ado, Let's see why if you've got the and, or, and not gates, then this is a universal set, okay? So remember the definition of universal is that, you know, uh, we, uh, we can use these gates to express any Boolean function on any number of bits, right? So we need to sh give a construction that does that, right? So, uh, which means that in order to prove this theorem, you know, we'll have to start out with some arbitrary Boolean function on n bits. Um, but we could also just do an example, you know, as long as it's, as long as we make it completely clear that, you know, what we do in our example would, 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 uh, would generalize to any, you know, Boolean function. Okay. Um, so, Sorry. So how can we represent an arbitrary Boolean function? Well, there, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a general way to do it, which you may have seen before, which is called a truth table. Okay? Truth table just means you, know, you list every possible uh, combinate, every possible setting of the input bits, then for each one, you list, you know, uh, 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 what output do you want? All right, well, uh, so for example, uh, What's the truth table of the AND function, anyone? Zero, 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 one. Yeah. The truth table of the OR function is uh, zero, one, one, one. Truth function of the XOR function, anyone? Zero, one, one, zero. Yeah. OK, so now I could make up anything that I want over here. Like, let's, uh, let's do zero, one, zero, zero. Uh, zero, zero, one, zero. 
you know, there, there, uh, there is a nice Boolean function, okay? And now I have to show how to represent this, you know, arbitrary Boolean function uh, by a circuit of and or and not gates. So can anyone suggest how I might go about this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yeah. So in fact, you know, uh, all I can. Uh, that, 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 uh, that's exactly right. You know, but in fact, I can just look at those rows that output a one. Okay. Um, you know, in 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 fact, uh, what what I what I can do is I can just look for uh, you know those. Okay, in this case, there are there are, there are two rows of this function that, that lead to the output one, right? And so basically, what, what I'm trying to say with my circuit, right? What what my circuit is yearning to express is that uh, uh, you know you should output one if the input is this or if the input is this, and otherwise you should you know you should output zero. So how can we express that? How can we give voice to that to that statement? Yes. Exactly. So all I've got to do is uh, uh, for each of these rows that out that leads to a one, I just and you know I. I uh, uh, I, I, I implement a check that asks whether all the bits have the prop, you know, have have the right setting for, to be that input. So in this case, it's not x and not y and z. Okay, for this row down here, it's x and y and not z. Right. Okay, and again, I could implement these these ands as as ands of ands if I want them to have only fan in two. Okay, and then what do I do at the end? Yep, and then I or it. Okay, there. I just represented the function. Okay, and you know, in a way where you know we could clearly generalize this to any truth table of uh, uh, of any size, right? So, so incidentally, one thing that you know. Uh, uh, will uh, will interest us a lot, although you know we'll we'll only have the tools to to really start to understand it later in the course. Uh, is is the size of a circuit? Okay, by the size of a circuit, we just mean the number of gates in it. Okay, so uh, so this construction that we saw here. Uh, uh, if you've got a Boolean function of n bits, what is a, what, uh, what, what, uh, what's an upper bound on the size of the circuit that, that this construction will produce? Well, how, I mean, how big is the truth table, first of all? The truth table has got two to the n rows in it, right? Any of which could have a one in it. Okay, for each of those rows, how much logic are we using to, to uh, to, to, to check for that row. Yeah, okay, that, that's, uh, you know, that, 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 that's going to change things by a small factor, depending on, you know, whether we, all right, so, so, one, so one, um, what, uh, one thing about this course is that, you know, all the habits that you've learned of, like, being really precise and calculating things, that all goes out the window in this course, okay, and we're going to, yeah, what, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. So. Um, well, we well, we want to know the dependence on n, right? We want to. What? So. Okay. So. So. What can we say? So. So each. Um, we want to. So. So what's going to concern us is like is is asymptotics. Okay. So. Um, actually. Um, 
So, so probably, you know, most of you have already seen uh, O notation in 6042 or, or whatever, but um, just uh, to, to, to refresh your memory about it, let me, uh, let me show you the, the notation that we're going to be using uh, a lot in this course. Okay, so, so we're, you know, we'll, be, we'll be very interested in you know, the growth rate of functions. So in this particular example, we'd like to know just the, the, the rough growth rate of the number of gates in the circuit as a function of n. Okay, uh, th that's what we want to know, and you know, we, don't, we don't care that much about the leading constants. I mean, we can work them out if we, if we really want to. But, uh, uh, but mostly we're interested in what can be captured using this notation. So, uh, so f of n, we say, is big O of g of n if there exist constants a and b such that f of n is at most uh, a times g of n plus b for all n. Okay? This, by the way, the, this means for all, this means there exists. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so what that is saying, you know, if you unpack it, is it's just saying that f of n is, you know, grows asymptotically at most as fast as g does. Okay, so g is an asymptotic upper bound on f. Okay, so uh, for example, uh, we could say that n squared is big O of n cubed. Okay, you know, this grows faster than this does. Okay, we could even say that. Um, Ten n squared is big O of n squared, okay? Because we don't care about the ten, right? That that can just be absorbed into this constant a here, okay? But uh, it is not it is not true that n cubed is big O of n squared, okay? Uh, We say that f of n is big omega of g of n if there exists a constant a greater than zero and b such that f of n is greater than a g of n minus b for all n. Okay, so this is say this is saying just the converse thing that that uh, that g is an asymptotic lower bound on f. Okay, when you go out to large enough n's then f grows asymptotically at least as fast as g grows, okay? And uh, so in, uh, um, in, in theoretical computer science, you know, this kind of statement is very highly prized. We like to prove lower bounds on, on uh, the complexity of things uh, 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 when we can, okay? Uh, so, you know, we could make the opposite statements here. Uh, n squared is not theta of n cubed. Uh, by the way, some people, you know, if they really want to be pedantic, they'll say n squared is contained in big O of n cubed, right? Because, like, what, is it, what the hell does it mean to set this equal to this anyway, right? You know, this, this, is, this is actually a set of functions that contains this. All right, but you know, I'm, I'm just sort of using the equal sign as a shorthand for is, right? Like if I say Bob is tall, you know, I'm not saying that the concept of tallness coincides with the concept of Bobness, you know. So I'm, I'm just I'm just using it to mean is. Okay. So all right, uh, and you know, we, but but we could say that n cubed is omega of n squared. Okay, now uh, we say that f of n is big theta of g of n if just both of these things hold. f of n is big L of g of n and it's also big theta of g of n. Okay, so this means that f and g grow asymptotically at the same rate. Okay, that means that you have, act, you have really pinned down the rate at which f grows, if you can make a statement like that, uh, a big theta statement. Okay. 
And then there's one last one that we, we sometimes like. We say f of n is little o of g of n. If for all positive a there exists a b such that f of n is at most or is less than a g n plus b uh, for all n. Okay, so this is saying that f of n grows at asymptotically less than uh, the rate of g of n. Okay, so it's saying that the g of n is an upper bound and it's, and it's a strict upper bound. Okay, so, so we could say that n squared is little o of n cubed, that's true, but 10 n squared is not little o of n squared. Okay, so uh, questions about these? All right, so we'll, 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 we'll you know, there's, not, there, uh, there's nothing deep about these. We'll, 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 we'll have a few PSAT problems to, you know, to, to nail these down, you know, including, you know, with some, 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 some slightly uh, less obvious examples. Okay, so, uh, so now, uh, you know, I, we can say uh, uh, we are interested in, you know, the, uh, the size of this circuit, you know, that's produced by this construction. What is it big O of? Okay, uh, so so in terms of big O notation, right? How how does the size of the circuit grow as a function of n? Yeah. Huh? Yes, per row it's O of n exactly. And how many rows are there? Two to the n. Yep. So we can say that this construction produces a circuit of size uh, 2 to the n times n. Okay, and you can see that, you know, uh, between these two terms, you know, uh, 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 this one is the heavy hitter. Okay, you know, the other one just, you know, b uh, barely even matters. Okay, it's the, it's, it's the 2 to the n that's really the killer here. Okay, uh, because, you know, if n is 1,000, this is telling you that, yes, this construction would theoretically work, but, you know, it will produce a circuit with more than 2 to the 1,000 gates. Okay, how big is 2 to the 1,000? That's, well, it's more than 10 to the 300, right? Uh, the number of subatomic particles in the observable universe is about 10 to the 85, okay? So this is more, you know, if, if, if even if, if, if every, you know, you miniaturized your gates that every one had one subatomic particle, right? This is way, this is a circuit that's way, way bigger than, you know, would, uh, would fit in, you know, in, in that part of the universe where the light has, re uh, has reached us since the Big Bang, okay? That's a big circuit, okay? So, so, so this, you know, and, and this is exactly the kind of issue that, you know, we uh, we're interested in in complexity theory, right? That when you get uh, an exponential growth, you know, it blows up in your face to the point where, you know, something, you know, even if something theoretically exists, it's, you know, it, it, it's just uh, a practical impossibility. So, uh, so, so you might wonder, you know, could there be an improved construction? Could there be a, you know, a way to construct a circuit for an arbitrary Boolean function of n bits uh, that used few, fewer than this number of gates, you know, ideally way fewer. Okay, well, we'll, uh, we'll come back to that question. Okay, uh, let me just uh, uh, observe first that, uh, you know, we didn't, uh, in, in this universality construction, we didn't actually need, you know, the and, or, and not gate. We can, we can actually get rid of uh, uh, something and still have it be universal. Oh, 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 oh. What can we get rid of? Anyone? Yeah. Yes, yes, either one, right? So, so let's, let's just, Let's argue that and and not are already universal by themselves, okay? Well, to show, you know, this is another point that's gonna recur, right? If you've already proved that A is, you know, thing A is universal, now you wanna show that thing B is universal, okay? It's now, you know, it's enough to show that thing B can emulate everything that thing A does, okay? Uh, you, you know, this, this we call an argument by reduction, right? 
you know, the, 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 uh, the standard joke, you, you know, how do you, um, how do you, how do you boil water, right? You know, you, you fill a pot with water, you put it on the stove. What if the, uh, uh, what if the water is already in the pot? Then what do you do? Well, then you dump the water out. You thereby reduce the problem to one that you already solved. Okay. So, okay. So how can we reduce the, the problem of showing that and and not are universal to, to one that's the, the, that we've already solved? Yeah. Yep, and how do we do that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so we say not the and of not x and not y. That's exactly right. Equals the or of x and y. Okay, this is called the De Morgan's law. Okay. As I said, discoveries came easier in the 1800s. Uh, so, uh, so you can check that not of and of not x and not y is or of x, y. Okay, and the converse also holds. Not of or of not x and not y is and of x and y. Okay, so which means that you know you only once you have a not gate, then you only need one of and and or, and then you can generate the other one. Okay, in fact, we can even um, uh, so so this this shows that and and not, for example, is a universal set. Uh, in fact, we can even do better than that. We can even have a single gate, which is universal. Anyone know an example? Yeah, the NAND gate. Yeah. Okay, so so how can we show that NAND is universal? Oh, uh, so someone else. Yeah. Yep. Good. So so how do we make a, a, a knot out of a NAND? Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Okay, now how do we make a how do we make an and out of a net? Yep. Yep. Now that we have a knot, you know, now we might as well just put that on top of the end. <laughs> and then we've got an end. All right, there we go. Yeah. Uh yeah. So, okay, so that uh, so, so so that uh that that uh that's a good point. I was assuming here that yeah that 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 you that you're allowed to just um, uh, 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 you know have have two wires coming out of the same uh, bit. So this this by the way is is something that we call fan out. Okay. So so yes, we're you know we're assuming that that you are allowed to copy bits arbitrarily. Okay. Uh, that's that that that's an assumption. That's um, uh, that, that we'll make when you know, we're talking about circuits. Uh, interestingly, when we come to uh, qu quantum computing at the end of the course and we talk about quantum circuits, we will find that we need to drop that assumption. Okay? In the quantum world, you're not allowed to copy things arbitrarily. Okay? But in the you know, classical bits, sure. You know, you've, heard that, uh, you've all heard from, from Stallman right, that information wants to be free. Right? Or you know, it, can, it can be, you know, it, it, it wants to be copied all over the place. Okay, so there you go. All right. So okay. So now you know we know that, that the NAND gate is universal, and in fact, you know, if we did this construction, you know, with NAND gates only, you know, the size of the circuit would change by only a constant factor, right? Because you know every uh, uh, AND and OR and NOT gate can be represented by some constant number of NAND gates, like two or three of them. Okay, so, so we can represent any Boolean function of n bits using at most n times 2 to the n, or O of n times 2 to the n uh, NAND gates. Okay, but now, um, let's, uh, now let, let's come back to the question, uh, is that optimal? Could we, could we improve that? You know, could there be a way that we could represent any n bit Boolean function using only, let's say, n squared NAND gates? That would be right. That uh, 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 that would be awesome if we could do that. All right? Yeah. Yeah. 
So, all right. I mean, no, it, it's, 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 yeah, it's worth think, thinking about, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so, so there, are, there are very often, you know, tricks for simplifying circuits, building them out of a smaller number of gates, right? Sometimes, you know, you might come up with a naive way of building a circuit. Like, like, like for example, let's say you wanted to compute the majority of n bits, right? You could do it this way. Right, you could do it using this truth table construction, but that would be a wildly inefficient way to do it. Right? In fact, you know, uh, it is possible to create a circuit that computes the majority of uh, among n bits using only about uh, n times log n gates. Okay, I think maybe, uh, maybe even a linear number of gates. Okay, but uh, you know, uh, um, I'll. I'll, I'll uh, I'll, I'll check how hard it is, and you know, if, if it's not too hard, I'll put it on the P-set. Okay, <laughs> but uh, um, but uh, but but you know, there are there are many many cases where you know you can you can express something you know interesting, complicated using using a circuit which is actually quite small, right? And or you could start out with a complicated circuit and then simplify it using. Carnot maps or, or uh, uh, whatever you call them, okay? Uh, but now, you know, uh, uh, with our sort of 6045 goggles, you know, we want to, uh, the question we want to ask is, uh, is, is it possible that you could always do that? Or, you know, or is there some obstruction, you know, that's going to require some Boolean functions to, to always need circuits of, of, of exponential size? Okay. And uh, so, 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 so one way that we could approach that question is that you know we could just try to come up with specific examples of functions that we think require exponential size circuits, right? Like uh, you know one good candidate would be uh, uh, if we took an N, you know a Boolean function that encoded an NP-complete problem. Okay, you know I haven't told you yet what NP-complete problems are, but uh, you know uh, for for example. Let's say that the uh, these zeros and ones, you know, encoded uh, w whether there there was an edge or there wasn't an edge between various pairs of vertices in a graph. And now the Boolean function will be one if that graph contains uh, a Hamilton cycle, which is a you know a, a path a tour that visits each vertex exactly once. Right? That's a that's a famous you know. NP-complete problem. It's one for which we don't, you know, know any efficient algorithm to solve it. And so you might say that maybe it should also require circuits of exponential size. In fact, you know, the the, the question of you know finding a you know specific problem like that one, where you can prove that it requires exponential size circuits, is very very closely related to the p versus NP question. Okay, which we're going to talk about later in the course. And we'll see exactly how you know this uh, uh, this question is related to p versus np. Okay, but suffice it to say for now that you know it's it's also an, an insanely hard question. Okay, we have you know we hope someday if civilization lasts long enough that we'll be able to prove that this Hamilton cycle fun function you know requires circuits of exponential size. Okay, but right now. You know the best that we can prove for for such functions is that like they require circuits of size at least three n or something, right? You know we can prove that they require circuits. You know we can't even prove that such functions require circuits of more than linear size. Okay, is what I'm saying, right? And 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 people just just fight about the exact you know to to improve the exact constant you know in front of the n. Okay, that uh, that uh, that's the best that people can do today, right? It's kind of pathetic. Okay. Uh, so, you know, but, but we will sort of see later in the course why it's such a profoundly difficult mathematical problem to, you know, take a particular function that you care about and then prove that, let's say, there is no circuit of, you know, linear size or of n squared size or something that could possibly compute that function, right? Very, very hard to prove that kind of statement, okay? Uh, OK. 
Okay. But uh, in uh, 1949, uh, Claude Shannon uh, uh, did something, you know, which is sort of um, 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 obvious in retrospect, but we, you know, which is, which is uh, uh, you know, an, an amazing uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 shift of perspective. Okay, what he what he said is that I cannot. It's true. I can't give you a single example of a Boolean function that requires gigantic circuits. Okay, but I can prove that such functions exist. Okay, and not only that, I can prove that almost every function requires gigantic circuits. Okay, even though I don't have a single example of one. Okay, so how did he do that? Well, he used what mathematicians know as a counting argument. Okay. So, so the basic idea here is that we're just going to count how many different Boolean functions are there of n bits. And then we're going to count how many different circuits are there of a small size. Right? Uh, and, and then we're going to use the, f okay, we're going to use the following observation. That, you know, it's possible that, that two, you know, two completely different circuits could represent the same function. Right? This, this can certainly happen. Okay, but it never happens that the same circuit represents two different functions, right? You know, once you've specified a circuit, you know, a circuit is just a way of specifying the function, right? So each circuit can represent one and only one Boolean function, okay? Which means that if there's a gigantic set of, you know, possible Boolean functions, you know, you should think of this, this oval as gigantic. Okay, uh, and there's only a small number of circuits, you know, of, of a small size that can, you know, that, that there can possibly be, then, you know, there's, there just aren't enough circuits to go around, right? Which means that most of these functions, you know, even if we can't give examples, we know that sort of, uh, um, you know, the, the, uh, the chocolate chips fail to cover the cookie, okay? You know, m most of the, uh, uh, m most of the functions that are out there have to fail to be represented by any small uh, circuit because there aren't enough of them. Okay, so let's let's do the calculation and let's let's see exactly what comes out of it. Okay, so the first thing we have to ask is uh, how many uh, different Boolean functions are there uh, of, of, of that take n bits of input? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, 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 so some, you know, uh, um, some years when I ask this question, I get a guess of two to the n, right? You know, and two to the n is big, but it's not nearly big enough for, for what we're talking about here, okay? Uh, because the, you know, the question here is how many different truth tables are there, right? You know, each Boolean function corresponds to one truth table, right? And it, you know, it's just a single truth table already takes two to the n bits to specify. Okay, because you've got two to the n different inputs, and for each one, you know, you choose whether the output is a zero or a one, you know, you know, in order to specify a Boolean function, right? So you've got two to the n choices to make to specify one function. Okay, which means that if we're interested in the total number of Boolean functions, then this is actually two to the two to the n power. Okay, this is doubly exponential. All right, so now, the next question that we need to ask is how many Boolean circuits are there of size at most s? Okay, and to, to clarify, um, let's say that we're talking about circuits uh, that are over n input bits, x1 up to xn. And, uh, and let's say that these are circuits of NAND gates only, okay? Because we all, we've already seen that NAND is universal. Okay, so we don't have to worry about different types of gates. Okay, we're just, we're just asking sort of how many different ways are there to string together a circuit of, you know, at most S NAND gates, uh, you know, to, to, in order to create a Boolean, func uh, Boolean circuit on N input bits, okay? And, you know, and once again, we don't really care about the exact number, right? The exact number may be something complicated and messy and 
depend on what we you know, identify as being equal to what. Okay, I, all I really want here is an upper bound. I want a reasonable upper bound on the number. So, um, okay, this is all available on the syllabus, this information, okay? Uh, so, all right, so let's, let's just do this by plunking down gates one at a time, right? How many choices are there for, you know, how to, how to put, just say, a single NAND gate, you know, for, for these end bits? Well, yeah, it's basically n choose two, you know, except that, well, let's say we allow, you know, the NAND gate could take the same two bits as input, so then it's actually n choose two plus, plus n. Okay, but between friends, let's just say it's n squared, you know, I mean, seriously, right? <laughs> you know, we, we, you know it's, it's, a, it's just a factor of two difference anyway, okay? So, um, all right, and, and now, um, you know, now how, how many choices are there for the, for the second NAND gate that we put down? So let me draw the first one. How many choices are there for the second NAND gate? Yeah, one more. Well, okay, let's say, let's say n plus one squared, right? Because now, we, you know, we've got, you know, the, the new NAND gate could take any of these two guys as input, but it could also take the output of the, of the first NAND gate as input, right? So there's really n plus one choices here for each of the, the uh, uh, for, uh, for, for each of the two wires, for both of the wires, okay? So, so, so we've got n plus one squared choices for the second NAND gate. How about for the third NAND gate? n plus two squared. Now we've got two NAND gates, you know, in the house. So we can, you know, you know, the output of either of those can be the input to our third NAND gate, okay? And for the next one, we've got n plus three squared and so forth. Let's say all the way up to n plus s minus one squared, right? But, you know, again, you know, I don't like messy expressions, okay? So, between friends, let's just say that this thing is at most, eh. Let's say, just say that each of these guys is at, most, is at any rate at most n plus s, right? So this thing is really at most n plus s to the 2s, right? There we go. Okay. So now what we've got is that there are at most n plus s to the 2s uh, different circuits of, uh, di uh, of NAND gates uh, of, size, of size s. Okay, and, and actually we were interested in circuits of size at most s. But the truth is the ones of size less than s will just add such an infinitesimal amount to this that I'm not going to worry about it. Okay, you know, the, 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 it's going to be a geometric series, right, or, or more than geometric series, actually, and it's going to be totally dominated by the last term in the series. All right, so let's, so let's just worry about that. Okay, and now, you know, we know that, that if S is big enough that every Boolean function, you know, of size n can be represented by a circuit of size S, then this needs to be greater than or equal to what, anyone? two to the two to the n, right? This needs to be big enough that there can be a circuit for every Boolean function of size n, okay? So now all that's left to do is to solve this for s, okay? So how can we solve this, anyone? Well, you know, anytime you've got stuff in the exponent, you know, you want to get at it, you know, the first step is to log both sides, right? So, so there, we have this. Now, how, how, how do we solve this thing for s? Anyway. Well, 
once again, you know, if, 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 if you fixate on finding an exact solution, uh, there's not going to be a closed form solution, you know, for S in terms of N, that, you know, involving sort of any function that, the, that you've ever seen before. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so, so let's just forget about getting an exact solution, right? Uh, you know, we basically, you know, th this N is actually going to be like totally unimportant because S is going to be so much bigger than N anyhow. Uh, this factor of two is also going to be, you know, unimportant in the, in the scheme of things, okay? So really what we, you know, want to know is like how big does S have to be for S log S to exceed two to the N? Anyone want to give me an estimate? I mean, let's say that S was, was, two, was, was 2 to the n. Then what would S log S be? 2 to the n times n. So even if S was all the way at the top, if S was 2 to the n, you know, we've, we've only sort of overshot the target by a little bit. You know, we've gotten up to, only up to 2 to the n times n. Okay, so maybe we should scale back S a little bit. Anyone have a guess for what, what S should be to satisfy this? Okay. Well, it turns out that the, uh, the S that will satisfy this is going to be about 2 to the N divided by N. Okay. And, uh, you know, I, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the best way to come up with this is just to, to play around with things until you find something that works. Okay. Or, or just, you know, how you have, have experience with similar things. Okay. So like, you know, but, but here, but here's a way of, you know, once I've told it to you, here's a way of checking it, right? We can just say what's what's two to the n over n times log of two to the n over n, right? Well, log of two to the n over n is what anyone? It's it's log of two to the n minus log of n, right? Let's say that all our logs are base two, just to you know, be friendly, all right? So that's like n minus log n, right? Okay, so this minus log n is just some little piece of crud, okay? That's just, you know, not going to affect anything. Basically, we have here 2 to the n over n times n is about 2 to the n. That's a, you know, that's what we want, okay? So, you know, um, so I'm, I'm trying to inculcate you in the ways of bounding, okay? Yes. Okay, good. Yep. Yeah, that, that, that's right. Okay, so 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 so, so actually, you, uh, you actually you ask a very good question. So here's the thing: like, if 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 this were physics, right, then I could just do a whole long chain of this is approximately equal to that is approximately equal to that you know, and just neglecting the lower order terms that we know, you know, don't really matter, except sometimes they do, but, you know, you know, uh, right, right, okay. You know, if, if we were, you know, uh, uh, you know, if this were, say, a calculus course, right, then we would only need, you know, you know, we, we would have, we want to be much more careful. We would want to chalk chain of equalities and just know what's exactly equal to what. Okay, in theoretical computer science, we mostly want bounds. Okay, so, so the reason why we're allowed to be, you know, this fast and loose is that, you know, our final answer that we want is only a big O or a, or a big omega, okay? So, so we know that, you know, we are, you know, uh, you know th th this, this is an exactly true statement. This expression is at most this expression, right? You know, I have upper bounded it, okay? I know that all I need for the number of circuits is an upper bound. You know, and so, you know, I'm not allowed to err at all in the, uh, in the opposite direction, right? I'm not allowed to undercount, you know, the number of circuits, even by one, but I'm allowed to overcount by as much as I want because, you know, all I'm going for is an upper bound here, right? And, you know, and, and, and if I make a mistake, if I overcount by too much, that will just mean that the, that the bound that I get at the end will be maybe weaker than, you know, uh, than I'd like it to be, but it won't be false, right? Okay, so, uh, so, so here, you know, I claim, uh, so, so if you want to be uh, precise about it, the claim would be that there is some uh, 
constant multiple of 2 to the n over n uh, that sort of uh, over satisfies this, this, you know, uh, the, 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 this inequality, right, for, for which uh, s times log s is more than 2 to the n. And there is some other constant multiple of 2 to the n over n for which s log s is less than 2 to the n. Okay, so, so therefore, whatever is we say about the s that satisfies this, it is some constant multiple of 2 to the n over n. Right? That, would be, that would be the formal statement to make here. Okay, or, or this. This is what we want to say. Okay, s is big theta of 2 to the n over n. Okay. Now, um, well, okay. That that that's the, uh, or, or or at least uh, 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 the 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 solution to this equation is big theta of two to the n over n. Okay. The conclusion of the argument uh, is that uh, is that the number of 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 gates that we need to represent an arbitrary Boolean function is big omega of two to the n over n. Meaning the you know. So from this argument, we conclude that to represent an arbitrary Boolean function of, of n bits, you need at least on the order of 2 to the n over n NAND gates. Okay? You know, maybe it's more than that. Right? You know, the upper, what was the upper bound we had? Well, well, you can see that the upper and lower bounds here are off by a little bit. Right? The upper bound that we got was 2 to the n times n. Okay? The lower bound was 2 to the n divided by n. So they're off by a factor of n squared, right? You know, but they're but they're pretty close in the scheme of things, right? So you could say, you know, we have shown that you can represent any Boolean function with about two to the n gates, and in fact, you need two to the n, uh, you know, about two to the n gates to represent an arbitrary Boolean function. Okay. Now you might wonder about the exact answer. So if, if you invest enough work, um, in fact, it can be proven. Was, was proven by uh, various Russians in the 1960s that, uh, that, this is, that this is tight, okay? That in fact, you can represent, so you can improve the construction. The construction is the, th is the thing that has to improve here. You can give a better, um, an optimized construction that represents any Boolean function of n bits using only about two to the n o divided by n gates, okay? And that, that's a, you know, considerable amount of work to, to do it and, and not all that interesting either. So we won't, you know, so, so, so I'm not going to cover it here. Okay, but, uh, but counting arguments have the remarkable property that, you know, that often not only do they give you an answer, they give you the tight answer. They give you exactly the right answer. Even though, you know, they didn't give you a single example of a, of a Boolean function, you know. <laughs> we still don't have a single example of a Boolean function that requires an exponential size circuit. We just know that they're almost everywhere, <laughs> okay? Uh, so if we wanted an explicit example of a Boolean function, like if you wanted to program your computer to just come up with, you know, deterministically a Boolean function that requires exponential size circuits, uh, 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 how could you do that, anyone? Can anyone suggest a way to do that? Well, there's a really, really stupid way to do it. Okay, but uh, but amazingly, th this this stupid way is sort of almost the best that, that we know today. After you know, 60 years of research on, on these sorts of questions. Okay. And the way is this. So we can list all the possible truth tables of n uh, uh, bits, right? There are two to the two to the n of them, okay? Uh, and we can list them in what we call lexicographic order. What does lexicographic order mean? It just means that we, 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 we start with the all zero string and then we just, we just keep incrementing by one, viewing these as, as integers written in binary, okay? So it's just some standard way of ordering all of the possible truth tables of all the possible Boolean functions. 
okay? With, uh, uh, with, so, so these are three input functions, so they have 8-bit truth tables, which means that there are 256 of these functions. I'm not going to write all 256 of them, okay? Here's the first three. Here. Uh, I'll, I'll, just for you, I'll write one more, okay? All right, so, so we could list them all like this. We could then just go through this list one by one, you know, starting at the left. And for each one, we could just by brute force work out what is the size of the smallest circuit that, that represents this function, right? We could just loop, you could just program your computer to iterate over all circuits, you know, starting with the smallest, starting with size one, then size two, until you find, you know, one that represents your function, and you'll thereby find the size of the smallest circuit for each of these functions. Okay, and now you could program your computer to halt as soon as you get to a function uh, that requires a um, circuit of size, I don't know, 2 to the n divided by n squared, let's say. Now, we know from Shannon's counting argument that such a function must exist. All right, so since it exists, there must be a first one. So your computer will halt and find it, and which one it finds will be deterministic. There, I've just defined for you uh, an explicit Boolean function that requires exponentially large circuits. Okay, that was you know that was a little bit pathetic, right? It's like you know the the the, the thing, you know usual answer you know you ask a mathematician well, well, where am I? Uh, you're lost, right? Uh, just you know you know we've answered the question but without sort of saying anything very useful. Okay, so you know the big challenge here is to you know come up with a, come up with more natural examples of Boolean functions that still provably require exponential size circuits. Okay, so um, so so now you know you might say uh, you know we, you know we've shown in any case that that Boolean circuits are are universal, right? You can use them to represent any Boolean function whatsoever. So, so in that sense, you know, why isn't this just the model of computation that we want to use for the rest of the course? What are the drawbacks of circuits? What's the, what are the limitations of circuits? What can circuits not do? Anyone, does anyone see like, what, what aspects of the computers that we actually use are sort of missing in, in circuits? Memory, yeah. Yeah, that 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 that's a big one. That's you know, and that's actually the one I want to focus on here. The um, okay, so. Um, so, so we like to distinguish between uniform and non-uniform models of computation. So, uh, um, it, so circuits are an example of a non-uniform model, uh, which means that sort of you need a different circuit for every input size. You know, even if you've invested, you know, lots and lots of work to design like the perfect circuit for computing the majority function of a hundred bits. Right? Well, that's great. You pat yourself on the back, and then someone hands you an input you know, of 101 bits and asks you to take its majority. Right? Your circuit is completely useless. Right? You, you, know, you might as well just trash it and just start over from the beginning, designing a circuit for 101 you know, uh, uh, bit inputs. Okay, so that's that's not very useful, right? We would, you know, we would like to be able to design, you know, a single program, you know, that can handle inputs of arbitrary size, and in particular, we would like inputs that can, you know, we, sorry, we would like programs that can handle, you know, inputs that are much larger than themselves, right? Like the 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 total code base of Google, for example, you know, is pretty large. Okay, but it's a spec, you know, it's nothing compared to the entire size of the internet, right, which is the thing that it sort of takes as, a, 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 as its input, okay? So we like programs, you know, that can handle inputs that are much larger than themselves, and circuits don't do that, right? You know, a circuit is, you know, sort of, um, you know, if, if, if it's a circuit that acts on all n bits of the input, then it has size at least n. Right, and so it's at least as big as the input that it's that it's operating on. Okay, so uh, uh, so we want to move over to sort of non 
Oh, sorry, sorry, we want to move over to uniform models. A uniform model is one where you've got just a single program and it can handle you know, an input of any size. Okay, uh, uh, but you know, we want to get our feet wet with this. So we're going to start out with maybe uh, uh, the simplest type of, uh, of uniform computer that, that there is, and this is uh, what we call a finite automaton. Okay. Now, um, uh, you can think of a finite automaton as basically just a very, very hobbled computer uh, that can only read its input in one direction. Okay? It can only read its input from left to right. And just, you know, uh, you know uh, if, 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 it's, if it's a Hebrew or Arabic finite automaton from right to left. Okay? Uh, either way, you know, it, but it can only remember a little bit about you know what it's seen so far. Okay. So uh, so the basic idea is uh, and 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 there and there's actually a, a, a more modern name for these which is sh streaming algorithms. Okay, so uh, uh, you know, the, the, there's actually been like a resurgence of interest in these kinds of things recently because, you know, because of big data. Because you, know, you actually want sort of uh, a program that can just make a single pass through a you know, massive number of terabytes of data. Right? You don't have time to make multiple passes and just you know, learn something interesting even while it's doing that. Okay, so even you know, the sort of most rudimentary models of computation that we're going to see in this course, you know, they still have uh, uh, applications today. Okay? Uh, but anyway, the idea is that you, know, you, you get this, this sort of stream of bits and you can read it in one direction. Okay, you're, you're some device, and, uh, you know, and, and, and you know, your, your, your construction, you know, the, the, the construction of the device, you know, might be complicated. It might, you know, have all kinds of uh, uh, components to it. But, you know, we want to abstract away the details of the construction of the device. And what we want to say is that, you know, whatever this device is doing, you know, it has the property that, 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 that sort of what, what, whatever it has remembered about the, the bits that it's seen so far can be encapsulated in a, a single object that's called the state. Okay? Uh, so, um, so, 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 in other words, there is a finite number of different configurations that this, of different internal configurations that this machine can have at a given point in time. For example, it could have a switch which is either on or off, right? That would be a two state automaton. It could have two switches which are each independently either on or off. That would be a four state automaton, okay? But at any rate, you know, it has a finite number of possible states. That's the key limitation here. Uh, um, well, uh, why is that an important limitation, anyone? Well, you could say it's, it's, first of all, it's important for a physical reason, right? Ha, uh, how on earth do you build a device that has infinitely many states? Okay, uh, you know, it would need an infinite amount of memory. Okay, uh, but, uh, uh, but secondly, you know, if, if we allowed an infinite number of states, that would just completely trivialize what we're talking about because we could then just say, you're going to read these bits from left to right and your state just consists of a record of all the bits that you've seen. <laughs> Okay, so you just, you know, you're just like a hungry, hungry hippo or something, right? You're just, you're just gobbling up these bits, okay? And, uh, you know, and then you just, you see all the bits and, you know, it's trivial. Okay, so, so we want to capture the fact that, the, you know, this machine only has a limited ability to remember what it's seen, right? It, it's going to be reading in very, very long inputs, but it only has a small memory to remember sort of, you know, the most important, you know, uh, facts about those, uh, about those inputs, right? Like it's, 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 uh, it's, 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 it's studying for the test, okay? It's just, it's skimming for, you know, at the end there's going to be a final exam and it wants to, you know, only retain the most important material from this, from, uh, from this string. Okay, so, um, so let's, you know, you know, since it'll only take two minutes or so, you know, let's, let's just do an example of a finite automaton. Uh, I would like a finite automaton that just checks whether there are any one bits in this string. Uh, how do I, okay, so 
So the automaton, as I said, it has some finite number of possible states. Let's call the states like A and B. Uh, it also has uh, you know, one of the states we designate as a start state. Okay, well, let me designate A as the start state here. Okay, and uh, you know, it, it, some of the states are accepting states and others are rejecting states. Okay, so I'm going to call B uh, an accepting state. You know, it's a state where, where it accepts the string and I'm gonna call A a rejecting state. Okay, uh, and now what we can do is we can define uh, transitions among these, these states. So, so this is a finite automaton that reads a string of zeros and ones. So we say that it's alphabet, uh, the set of symbols that it can read and which is denoted by sigma consists of zero and one. Okay, and then the key thing that you do in specifying a finite automaton is that you define a function that takes, um, so let's say that, that, that S is the set of states. You know, in this case, it's A and B, right? And then what you do is you define a function that maps a state and an alphabet symbol to a new state. This is called the transition function of the finite automaton, okay? So, so, so you define a, a function that, uh, that says given what state you're in now and given what symbol you're reading, here is the new state that you're going to go to. And then you go and read the next symbol. Okay, so uh, and, you know, we, can, we can represent such a function using arrows. So like if you're, so now I said I, I want a finite automaton that's going to accept if and only if there's any one in my string. So what should, what, what arrows should I draw from this A state? Anyone? Huh? If, if I'm in state A and I read a zero, what should I do? Stay in state A. If I'm in state A and I read a one, what should I do? Go to state B, yeah, because now I know that I can accept. Okay, if I'm in state B and I read a zero, what should I do? Stay in B. If I'm in state B and I read a one, what should I do? Stay in B. There we go, our first finite automaton. Okay, so uh, uh, next Tuesday uh, we will, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see a couple more examples. We'll prove some theorems about what finite automata can do and what they can't do uh, and what else they're equivalent to. And uh, PSET 1 uh, should be out this weekend. Okay.